So I'd like to tell you today about the work that we've been doing at uh, Coursera for the last couple of years and trying to convince you that this phenomenon of MOOCs is no longer an experiment. We've moved beyond that. But let me start historically with what was the experiment, um, which is in September of 2011 at Stanford University. We took technology that we'd been building at Stanford for a number of years before that and decided to just give it a go. We took three graduate courses in computer science and put them up for anyone around the world to take for free. We were expecting an enrollment of maybe a few thousand people in these rather advanced courses, but within a matter of weeks, each of them had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more. So that for us was a real revelation because it demonstrated the ability to take the kind of high quality education that had been available up until that point only to a tiny number of privileged students at institutions like Stanford or UCL or others and um, make it available for anyone around the world with an internet connection, what is effectively a close to zero marginal cost per student. And that opportunity was too large for us to pass up. And so in January of 2012, we decided to spin this out of Stanford as a separate effort called Coursera, uh, which works with multiple top universities to take some of the great education that they've been offering and make it available to everyone. We um, launched in April of 2012, so just a little bit over um, two years ago. At that point, we had four university partners, Stanford, Princeton, Penn, and Michigan. Uh, we had 37 courses from those four partners, and um, we had 200,000 legacy students left over from the Stanford experiment. So fast forward um, just a little over two years, and this is where we are today. Uh, we have over 8.1 million students from every country in the world, with the exception of North Korea. Uh, we have 670 plus <coughs> courses from 110 different partners. And let me talk a little bit about some of those numbers before we delve into the actual substance of the talk. So let me start by talking about our university partners because that's the basis on which everything rests. We are fortunate to be working with many of this world's finest universities in all regions of the world. Uh, we started out as a US-based effort, but now we have more non-US than US partners. So in addition to top US institutions like um, Stanford and Princeton and Columbia and Yale and Duke and Chicago and others, we also have um, a, a large number of uh, Europe's finest institutions, including three here in the, in the United Kingdom, Edinburgh, University of London, University of Manchester, um, Germany's finest, um, four from France, four from Switzerland, um, three from Australia, again, the top institutions in um, all of these different countries and are able to offer instruction taught natively in nine different languages. Um, the courses start out in computer science, but now are much broader than that. Um, so you can see that we have courses in philosophy, in digital cultures, in mental health and illness, medicine, business, arts, um, uh, engineering, uh, literature, music, and so on and so forth. So, and no, I do not want to join this network. Thank you. So, um, <coughs> So I'm going to structure my talk around this epiphany that we had a, f a couple of months ago about what, has, what we're starting to see as a virtuous circle that drives this transformation in higher education. Um, so this virtual circle, which has been accelerating over the past two years, um, starts out with content at the top, um, the amazing content that is provided by our university partners. That content, in turn, provides um, incredible value to learners. Um, and because learners find this valuable, they come in droves, and that's where we get the kind of growth that we've seen over the past two years. Now, that growth is what drives value to our university partners, and because they find it valuable, they continue to produce more content, and that's what keeps this going. So I'm going to talk about each of those four corners on this compass. Um, and I'll then conclude. I want to start with content, and specifically how do you provide content quality education at scale? 
So the first component of the education is that it is actually um, video-based instruction so that the student feels like there is a teacher there teaching to them. It's also not video that's shot from the back of, back of the classroom, but rather um, short videos that are targeted for an online consumption where the professor seems to be talking directly at you. So let me show a little bit what that looks like. Um, so here, I'm, I'm deliberately not playing the sound. This is uh, one of our earlier videos. Production values have only come up. You can see the professor teaching, writing on the tablet. And then when the video hits the yellow notch, it pauses and the students get asked a question. They are um, immediately told whether they're right or wrong and given a chance to try again. Now this is an important part of the user experience um, and it's interesting to contrast this with the kind of experience in, an, in a large lecture hall where we as instructors would often try and engage our students by asking them questions but um, when that happens um, typically 80% of the students are still scribbling the last thing we said and then there's maybe that smarty pants in the front row who's usually the exact same person every single lecture who answers the question before anyone else has even realized that a question had been asked. Um, here, every student engages with the questions and has a chance to sort of keep track of what's going on, which is really important, especially online. Um, but of course, that's not where the meaningful learning happens, and so that's where we've added um, a lot of weekly homework where the students actually actively have to solve problems. Um, in order to address the question of how do you provide meaningful feedback to 100,000 students when you don't have 5,000 teaching assistants, we've addressed, we've come up with two strategies for providing feedback and assessment at scale. The first is auto grading, where the um, uh, computer grades the work, and it turns out you could do that for a range of different types of work, um, including not just multiple choice, but also things like, for example, computer programs, computer models, and things like that. Um, it turns out that our instructors are capable of doing quite creative things with that technology. So here is one example uh, from a course in Georgia Tech called Introductory Physics One with Laboratory. Um, here the professor um, called Mike Schatz um, wanted to provide a lab experience to students who probably have never seen the inside of a lab. And so to do that, he had them do the experiment in using objects that are found in their own environment. For example, this girl throwing the basketball. Now, the experiment, they record the experiment, they upload that and their measurements onto the site, but the question is how do you grade the correctness of an experimental analysis when you don't know what the mass of the ball was? And so, in order to do that, Mike developed image processing software that actually tracks the ball, you can see the little red dots there, and computes accelerations and velocities and uses that as ground truth to check the correctness of the student's measurements. And so, there's a pretty creative use of the technology. Now, this is only half the story. The second half of the story is that my students at Georgia Tech, who have access to world-class lab facilities, said, wait a minute, we also want to do cool experiments in basketball courts. We don't want to go into the lab. And so now all of my students are also doing experiments in the wild, which they find much more engaging and relevant to their lives, and then are coming to class to do a flipped classroom model where they talk about the experiments that they did in small groups and get critiques from fellow classmates, and the whole class is much more engaged now and much more um, uh, able to see the relevance of what they're doing to their everyday lives. Now, it turns out that auto grading has significant benefits aside from scalability. Um, one important aspect is the instant feedback that students get when they submit the work. As opposed to traditional teaching, where it sometimes takes three weeks to get feedback, and I still don't want to join this group. Um, uh, Emma, I think they're in my bag. I think that's my Wi-Fi hotspot. Can you please turn it off? Thank you. Um, anyway, um, so the students um, here get feedback immediately about whether they are uh, right or wrong, and that allows them to come back and try again, and nicely the computer doesn't actually mind grading the same work more than once. And so what we see is this notion of um, self-mastery. Students come in, they don't get it, they, have, they try again, they still don't get it, and by the, by the time they try it a couple times, they've gotten what they need to know and they do better, not just on this assessment, it turns out, but also on the final exam. Now, this only takes you so far, because as I'm sure, especially in a conference uh, populated primarily by architects and design people, you're saying, well, I can't grade architectural designs like this. <laughs> um, and so in order to address that question, we've put in place uh, of, of grading much more open-ended work, we've put together a pipeline called peer grading, 
where students um, are, once they submit their work, get a very carefully constructed set of criteria where um, the instructor tells them what to look for when assessing the work of their peers. Each student submits work, submits feedback to five of their peers, gets feedback from five of their peers, and so you get a very rich set of feedback that allows you to refine your work. So um, here is an example of the kind of, um, of project-based learning that this really opens up. So this is a design class from the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania, eight-week design project class. Um, where the students submit first a problem specification, a concept, a prototype, and then an artifact. Each week they get feedback from five of their peers, so by the time they end, the course ends, they've gotten 40 pieces of feedback and have produced some pretty remarkable designs that Professor Ulrich tells us are as good as what he receives from his Wharton students. The other aspect of peer grading is that the students who engage in this effort tell us that it's not just about the grades. Um, it turns out that this is an incredibly valuable pedagogical intervention because figuring out how to critique somebody else's work is an incredibly valuable learning experience. And students, uh, and now most of the instructors who have used peer grading in the large scale MOOC format are now doing it in their on campus classes simply because it's such a valuable experience for their students. Um, I'm going to give one example of yet another project that this type of opportunity opens up. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. It's uh, Professor Scott Plaus from Wesleyan. Those of you familiar with Wesleyan know that it's a small liberal arts university with generally very small class sizes. By contrast, Scott Plaus's MOOC was the single largest MOOC ever offered with 250,000 people enrolled, which is kind of mind-boggling. Um, Scott's final project in the class was called Day of Compassion. Students were supposed to live 24 hours of their life embodying the virtue of compassion, analyze their results using the techniques of social psychology, and write up the results which were then peer graded. Several thousand people completed that final assignment. 700 got a perfect score on the peer grading process. Those 700 were then voted on by other learners in the class, and the top voted one got to go to Stanford to meet the Dalai Lama. And I'm going to tell you about that top project, and I, as I tell you about this, I want you to keep in mind that this is one of 700 that got a perfect score, so there's probably others that are almost as amazing. Um, the grand prize winner is a physician in India called Balesh Jindal, who decided to do something about the unfortunately pervasive problem of sexual violence against girls and women in India. She went to a local girls' school of lower income families um, with 2,000 girls um, explained to small groups about the problem of, with sexual violence and what it means, identified several dozen cases <coughs> of girls who have been subject to sexual violence, and is now offering them and their mothers um, pro bono treatment at her clinic. She also convinced several other of her fellow physicians to do the same for other schools in India. And so if you think about the impact that Scott Plaus has had on the world, even in this one course compared to what he had at just teaching his regular class at Wesleyan. Um, the, uh, the final um, aspect of the, of the user experience here, which I think is, um, is important, is um, directly feeds off of the peer grading process, which is that these courses are not lonely experiences of a student sitting there with a the computer, but there's a real uh, community that's formed around those courses that people can interact with and that is a very heterogeneous community with a very global perspective because you have students from hundreds of, you know, from over 100, 150 different countries. And that really enriches the experience for everyone, the students as well as the instructor. So one example from that is Leiden's Terrorism and Counterterrorism course, uh, where he um, wanted to get a feel for attitudes to terrorism worldwide, they vary widely, and so he surveyed students in 140 countries on their attitudes to terrorism and is now writing a research paper based on his findings about that. And we're seeing that in a variety of other disciplines, including design, including uh, nutrition, and so on and so forth. So that's on content, and now let me talk about growth and I'll talk about the two other points. So first of all, a few interesting statistics. Um, in the two years since we started this effort, there's been over 10,000 years of videos watched, 44 million quizzes submitted, um, 4 million of these open-ended peer-graded assessments, and one and a quarter million course completions. These learners come from all over the world, 
So um, this is a map of growth of learners, um, and I'm not showing the U.S. because it would squish the graph down, but um, you can see India, China, U.K., on number four, Brazil, Spain, but also countries that are not developed or BRIC. So for example, Indonesia, Nigeria, Egypt, uh, Mexico are all there. I'd like to point out this particularly interesting kink in the graph, which is um, uh, where the China graph, which went from this to this, um, that uh, was a consequence of our China launch in October 2013, which introduced a whole bunch of translated content, discovery portals, and hosting of videos behind the Chinese firewall. As a consequence, we now have over half a million learners in China and growing rapidly. Um, the way in which we achieve this kind of international growth is by thinking very, very consistently about access and access to populations that might not normally um, have that. So one way in which that's done is to ensure that the content is relevant to people whose native language is not English. Um, and we do that by, for example, having a very significant translation effort. Since we can't afford to pay professional translators to translate all of our courses into multiple languages, the way in which we did that is by leveraging the strength of our community. Uh, a couple of months ago, we sent out an email to um, all of our learners saying, do you want to help make the content accessible to other people who speak your native language? Within a week, we had 25,000 volunteers who were helping to translate the content into other languages, and that's something that is greatly increasing the access to people worldwide. Um, the other place where access has been important is uh, by focusing on mobile penetration. Um, even in the developed world, and certainly in the developing world, an increasing number of uh, access to the internet occurs via mobile devices, smartphones and tablets. In the developing world, almost uh, the majority of such access occurs on mobile devices. And so um, we, we now have both an iPhone and an Android app um, with other platforms coming up right now. And <coughs> over a million mobile users of whom 15% are in China. You can see Great Britain right after that, um, but then Brazil, Russia, um, and so on. The third opportunity for access is to address the last mile problem. Um, and uh, the way in which we've done that is by partnering with a number of organizations that have made available to our learners not only facilities with high throughput internet connection, but also um, facilitators who help guide the learning process. Their first such partnership was with U.S. embassies, who opened up their embassies in multiple, com in multiple cities abroad, as well as put um, at, uh, at the disposal of this experience um, embassy personnel and returning Fulbright scholars. But now we have similar partnerships with the Slim Foundation in um, Latin America, um, community centers, uh, library systems, and also one of our favorites, uh, the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, where the learning hub was a trailer with solar panels on the roof so as to give people their access to actually a course by the Commonwealth Education Trust on how to be better teachers in the developing world. So it was a really nice combination. Um, it was driven by the University of Geneva. Okay, so the next section of this is learner value. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the value to our learners. So first of all, let's talk about the statistics. Who are our learners so that we can see if we're giving them value? Um, it turns out that despite the dire predictions of how we're going to put universities out of business, which was never our intent, <coughs> only about 15% of our learners are actually currently enrolled students, and most of them are taking this as supplementary materials. Far more typical among our learners um, are adults, working adults, who want to make a better life for themselves and their families. So 70% are over 30 years old. Now, of that uh, population, a third are from the US, a third are from other developed countries like the UK, and a third are from emerging economies. And you saw the statistics before that this is not just um, the BRIC countries, but also many others. And we're fairly proud of the 4% um, that we have from Africa. We wish it would be larger, but 4% is pretty good. Um, and then finally, 50% of our enrollments are in courses that, um, that deliver career-relevant skills. Now, you could look at this number in two ways. First of all is to say it's awesome that 50% of our enrollments help people make a better life for themselves in a material and tangible way. The second is to point out that 50% are in other courses that all they do is make people happy by letting them learn something that they find interesting, which we're actually equally proud of. So um, focusing for the moment, though, on the people who get the tangible benefit, um, although we could talk about the others as well. Um, in order to make that 
benefit more uh, uh, real to people, uh, we have put in place a program called the Verified Certificate. The Verified Certificate is um, a way for them to get a credential that is branded by the university that has academic integrity built into it, it's identity verified, it's unforgeable, um, and allows them to take this and present this to an employer, for example, when applying for a job or when looking for a promotion. <laughs> Um, many, more and more of our students are now, especially in the career relevant courses, um, uh, opting into this. The other aspect of the verified certificate is that it also provides an answer to what I'm sure is a question that many of you are thinking about, which is how do you make a free education sustainable? Um, so this certificate is a fee service. It's not a very high fee. $49 is about average. Um, it's optional, remember, the learning is completely free. It's only the certificate, if you want it, costs money. And even here we have a financial aid program, which is if you are a learner who really can't afford $50 and can benefit from the certificate, you fill out a one-page application. We waive the fee. Currently about 20% of our learners are on financial aid and over 50% of African learners are on financial aid. Uh, I'm actually going to skip. Okay, the um, notion of certificates um, also helps address one of the fundamental critiques that um, you can read about in the media. Any of you who have ever read an article about MOOC certainly in the last year has read the, the, the damning critique that only 5% of people who begin a MOOC complete a MOOC. That statistic, as it happens, is true. It's true in our classes, it's true in other classes, in most other classes, well, on average. Um, it fails to notice the important fact that most people who sign up for a MOOC have no intent to complete it. Most of them are viewing this as a browsing experience. I want to find out what this is about. I want to find out what MOOCs are about. Um, they have no intent to actually engage in the MOOC in a serious way and complete it. If you go into the course about three weeks into it and ask the people who are there, are you committed to completing the MOOC for real with all of the assignments? Um, by the way, there's a number of learners who are really committed, but they're committed only to watching the videos, and they also <coughs> count against our retention stats. Even if they watch all the videos, they don't count as if they completed the class because they didn't do the homework. So if you go in and ask students, are you committed to completing the class, from among the ones who say yes, 63% um, of them continue on to completing the class. If they furthermore put this, that little bit of skin in the game, that $50 that, um, that they paid for the option of earning a verified certificate, then completion rates come close to 90%. Now, 90% is high for any online activity, including social games, and certainly for something that requires five to seven hours of pretty hard homework every week. So these actually are pretty um, comforting numbers to my mind. So um, I'd like to end the part of the presentation on um, value to learners by moving away from the career-oriented learners who are using this to earn a certificate in data analysis, for example, so that they can get a better job, although many of them are people in India who would not otherwise have access to that kind of better job. But I like to focus on the other kinds of learners that we have and how, what kind of value they might get. Now, I can stand here for easily an hour and tell stories about learners whose lives have been transformed by access to this kind of education, but I'm going to do just two. Um, this one is Sharmin Shahabuddin from Bangladesh. Sharmin is an activist in Bangladesh who wanted to do something about the problem of, um, of girls being sold into servitude to a husband or an employer. So she convinced a friend to run away with her and they opened a bakery. Now, it turned out, unfortunately, that neither Charmaine nor her friend knew how to run a bakery, and so the bakery wasn't earning a lot of money. It's only earning $900 a month, and that's not enough for two women to live on in Bangladesh. So Charmaine found out about our courses, and she started by taking um, a Penn class on economics, a Michigan class on model thinking, and then another Michigan class, and then some Irvine classes, and some more Penn classes, and finally a Wharton class on business, and learned how to run a business. And now Charmaine's Bakery is earning not $900, but $5,000 a month. And that's enough not only for her and her friend, but also to support five other women who she also saved from uh, a life of servitude. And in addition to doing that, Charmaine also makes sure that all of her employees have a certain number of hours every week um, to take additional Coursera classes so they can make a better life for themselves. 
So that's one example. And I'm going to give you a very different one. Um, this is Daniel. Daniel is a 17, actually now 18-year-old boy, who um, is severely autistic. Daniel, who actually visited us at Coursera a few weeks ago with his parents, um, has a speaking vocabulary of 150 words. Um, he communicates by typing on an iPad. But by doing so, was the star student in um, the University of Pennsylvania Modern Contemporary American Poetry class, and subsequently in multiple other classes. And you can see Daniel standing in front of the wall of certificates framed, on, framed in his bedroom. Um, Daniel says that this is not only the first meaningful educational experience that he's had after a life of special ed, but also a way for him to alleviate the severity of his disease. And I think the most um, profound demonstration of that is that Daniel has now been admitted to the University of Pennsylvania's Young, uh, um, young Scholars Program this summer and is going to sit in a classroom with a bunch of other people like any other normal student. And Daniel's father tells us that a year ago that would not have been an outcome that they could possibly have conceived of in terms of Daniel's well-being. And so this is yet another example of student value. OK, so now we're going to become much more pragmatic and answer the question of, OK, that's great and feel-good stories like Charmaine and Daniel are awesome, but I have a million other things that I could be doing, and why should I be doing this? Um, so the last part of the talk is for those of you who are faculty or university administrators, and why is this a worthwhile thing for you to engage in? <coughs> so um, one question is, um, what do these keywords have in common? So let's read some of them. Algorithms, art techniques, Beethoven piano sonatas, financial markets, data science, um, uh, operations management, natural language, a whole bunch of modern poetry. Here's what all of these have in common. If you do a search for these, one of these search terms on Google, on the very first page, you will find a Coursera host of class. So here's the example for data science, actually data analysis, the first unpaid hit is Wikipedia. The second is the Johns Hopkins class. So this is a really great way of getting visibility for something that you care passionately about in terms of revealing your work to the world. Now, it turns out that the people who hear about your institution are ones that normally would not have. So several of our institutions have done studies on the people who have taken their MOOCs, how many of them had never heard of the institution prior to taking the MOOC. And the numbers range from 40% on the one side to 98% on the other, or these people who have not heard of the institution. So it's a really great way of achieving visibility within a completely different population. Now, that visibility translates into um, potentially a new, a new influx of students into traditional programs, whether it's online programs or face-to-face -face programs. So here, for example, Penn State has taught a geographic information systems MOOC. They had a 24%, actually they had a four times increase in the number of hits on that part of their site, and a 24% increase in the enrollment in the corresponding online degree program. Um, University of London surveyed an, its incoming student group and found that 55% of them were influenced to apply by taking the University of London MOOC. Again, this is in the corresponding area. They estimate that they recruited about 100 new students, uh, and given that each of them pays a tuition of 4,000 to 5,000 pounds, they figure they more than paid for the cost of the MOOC. Um, the, um, and Cal Arts, which is a small face-to-face, -face, <laughs> high-quality arts program in the United States, the number of applicants to their music technology master fine arts tripled. And, many of the, and several of the students put their MOOC project in the application as part of their portfolio. So um, that's one piece, that's the visibility and student outreach. The final piece of this is the ability to improve teaching. Um, and so here's a view on this from one of our instructors. This is Ignacio Martinez, University of Virginia, who says that learning is often a black box in the classroom, but MOOCs allow us to see what students are doing. With hundreds of thousands of students, if there's a correlation to be found, we'll find it. And so this really provides an, a very new and important type of visibility into your teaching in order to see what's working and what's not. 
So, for example, here is a distribution of wrong answers to one of the questions um, on, on the platform. And you can graph this out and see that, you know, there's a whole bunch of one-off wrong answers. Those are the little crosses, but the big cross, like this one, is where 2,000 students made the exact same mistake. Now, if two students in a class of 100 make the same mistake, you'd never notice, but if it's 2,000, it kind of jumps out at you. And so you can now go in and tell the instructor, you know, here's a concept that maybe you should try and teach better. Um, or, alternatively, you can say to the student, here is the basis for your misconception. You might want to go back and re-watch this video and then come back and try again. And so you could provide personalized feedback to the students that's targeted at their mistakes. Now this is using behavioral data to inform teaching. The other type of data that you can use to inform teaching is um, the actual comments that students post on the discussion forums. So here, for example, Pavel Pevsner from UC San Diego, who say, we now see the huge contribution the MOOC provides to professors in our attempts to improve both our classes and textbooks. Where else could we get a gold mine of comments contributing to further improvements of our courses? Any serious textbook author should run a textbook-based MOOC first. As someone who published a textbook whose first, second, and third printing had numerous mistakes, um, I can tell you it would have been really helpful to get those comments going in. Um, so that's one dimension of improving teaching. The other dimension is, of course, just improving teaching on campus using, for example, the ability to flip the classroom. <laughs> So in flipping the classroom, instead of coming into class and just providing the same old lecture to students who are sitting there and passively taking notes, rather the students get the content delivering the basic skills practice in, um, in the online format using some really high quality online content. And then they come into class, it's not that they don't come to class, they come to class to have a much more meaningful dialogue with fellow students in small working groups or with the instructor and teaching staff. And that allows them to do active learning, allows them to do problem solving, joint design projects, um, the kinds of things that we often don't have enough time for in traditional teaching because of the need to cover the material. So here is how some of our instructors feel about this. Scott Rixner from Rice University. I will never, ever, ever teach a class any other way as far as I can tell. This is so much better. The students learn so much more. Or Scott Klemmer from UC San Diego, flipped classroom allowed me to do lab and programming during class time. Uh, by having students with me in class, I was able to correct in two minutes what would take the students hours to correct by themselves. And indeed, this manifests in better learning outcomes. So here, for example, um, are results from University of Wisconsin at Madison, who have been doing flipped classroom teaching for about a decade, long before MOOCs ever came onto the scene. And what you see here on the left is the grade histogram of a traditional taught class, and on the right-hand side, same class the next year with a blended learning format, same types of assessments, same level of rigor. And what you can see is that the um, students, basically, who were on the failing side of the distribution in the traditional class, often the ones who are not very well prepared and who lose track of what's going on in lecture and never regain, um, never regain it, um, they do much better in the flipped classroom. And the failure rates in this class have gone down from 30% to 5%, and these are pretty typical. So my final slide before we open this up, or my final section before we open it up to questions, is to take a step back and think about um, the university revisited. Um, and so I'd like to first talk about teaching and... Um, and a new view, and a different view on teaching. This is not actually my contribution. Um, it's one of our instructors, Christian Turwish, who taught a, an operations management class on Coursera, and whose final lecture was a case study of MOOCs. Christian argues that um, education is by force a Pareto optimal frontier where we trade off faculty productivity, the number of students that we teach in an hour as instructors, versus student learning outcomes. The large 300 person lecture hall, pretty good productivity, not so good learning outcomes. Office hours, in or the kind of individualized tutoring that students get at, say, Oxbridge, great learning outcomes, terrible productivity. Um, Christian argues that MOOCs give us a whole new frontier. Um, and that new frontier can be used in different ways depending on what we're trying to achieve. We can take the quality of education that we get in a large lecture hall and provided not to 400, but to 400,000 students. So you may or may not get better learning outcomes, but you sure as heck get improved productivity. Um, or you can take the same amount of time that faculty members spend in preparing and delivering and grading assessments 
and, um, and rather use that in a flipped classroom to improve learning outcomes. And so you may not improve productivity, but you improve learning. Now these are two points in this continuum, and this continuum provides us other opportunities, and depending on what goals we're trying to achieve, we can design things in different ways. So the final slide here is to really take a step back and say, um, so now let's think about what is the mission of a great university. And if you talk to most university administrators, they will tell you that the mission of a typical university is twofold. The first is to advance knowledge through research, and the second is to disseminate that knowledge via publication and teaching. Today, that's the two things that universities often focus on. But I think that what we're starting to see is the emergence of a third prong in the mission of a university, which more and more universities are starting to value. And I believe that in a decade, um, universities will be valued on their ability to perform not just these two, but also this third prong of affecting global impact via teaching scale. So I think in a decade, we'll see more and more universities for whom this is a core part of their mission, and part of their success is how well they're able to perform this as well. Thank you very much.